taught me so many things Like how to love And how to lose And how to choose Well, hello, this is Linda Carboneau and welcome to another edition of Walking Through Life. Today, I have a returning guest, Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. And today, we've got a lot to talk about. What have you been up to? And uh, we're going to be talking about your uh, movies series, your documentary movie yeah. series. And congratulations. I think you're about to reach your 800th show. And um, I appreciate greatly that you had hoped I could be on that one, which I think is the next episode. Unfortunately, the schedule didn't permit. But congratulations. It's really amazing. And you've, I know you've interviewed so many different people. So uh, the movie series, and I'm, I'm down here tonight to show a movie called Undeterred. Um, and it is a documentary about the, um, the U.S. policies around Border Patrol and how it's evolved and maybe devolved over the last 30 years. Uh, and particularly it focuses on a community on the southern border in Texas where there are folks that live within 100 miles of the border but there's only one road that goes up into the rest of Texas. And literally every time they leave their small town, they have to show ID to get into the rest of America. And sort of what's happening with our Border Patrol policies and these sort of, quote, no man's land or DMZs and the fact that our, um, as much as 80% of our population lives within 100 miles of the border of this country, both coastal borders and land borders. And therefore, 80% of this country falls under the jurisdiction of the Department of Homeland Security and the Border Patrol and a lot of things they can do to us that we don't even really realize, all within our own country. And uh, this, so, so that's the movie we're showing right now. I showed it in St. Albans last week, being one of our border towns, but I know there's also been a lot of uh, checkpoints down here yeah. in the White River and down into the Springfield direction. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of Vermont actually falls into that 100 mile corridor of within the border of Canada. And um, so we, we uh, we show movies that are uh, often a bit provocative. Uh, we show them in order to bring out the community to talk about issues of the day. Uh, it started by being a monthly movie series at the State House during a legislative session. Mm -hmm. And we were getting 50, 60, 70 people to show up and then having a panel afterwards on the topic. I thought, well, let's take it around the state when we're not in the legislature and allow folks and welcome folks from other communities yeah. to be a part of these conversations that are happening around the state. So, like I said, this one's about Border Patrol. We've showed a movie about, um, we've shown climate crisis movies. We've mm -hmm. shown workers' movies. One called Made in Dagenham was an early movie. It was based on a strike of women workers in the auto plants in, in England in 1968, I believe it was, mm -hmm. where they were making 50 cents on the dollar. They were sewing the, the seat cushions for the cars. And, uh, and they're like, why are we not paid fairly? Mm -hmm. And just the movie is about that strike and the strife within families, because it was a company town, so a lot of times spouses worked for the same Ford plant and the plant got shut down because once you couldn't put cushions on the chairs, you couldn't put out the cars. Mm -hmm. um, and just sort of what really goes into the struggle of workers' rights for fair pay and, and um, fair representation. We had a movie called 13th, which is about the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Folks, any of these movies, I'm sure you can find on Netflix and, and mm -hmm. check them out. Uh, 13th is a really powerful movie about how when we outlawed slavery in this country, we still um, basically incorporated some forms of slavery through our criminal justice or criminal injustice system. And especially since the, quote, war on drugs, um, which was really used to incarcerate civil rights folks in the 60s and early 70s and peace movement folks, uh, that, how has that manifested itself with respect to how many people are in prison, what's the proportions of them relative to our society, what are the laws we're passing that disproportionately impact communities of color um, and particularly poor people as well. So all of these movies uh, are about systemic challenges in our society mm. where uh, are the laws we're passing or the way people being treated really in line or out of line with the greater value set that we all claim to have yeah. within the freedoms and community and looking out for each other yeah. uh, energy that we all believe is part of this country. But there's real fissures there and maybe we expose those, talk about them and see if there's ways we can 
close those and become more welcoming to each other, uh, out build an economy for everybody, um, and uh, and move forward in a in a way that can maybe uh, have a planet for our children and grandchildren to live on. So there's a right. range of topics. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I, I wanted to share, too, um, we had talked about um, disability and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, stigmas of having a mental illness because you can't see. That's right. You can't see. And last it. month we showed a movie, uh, Intelligent Lives. We've yes. shown it a couple times yeah. about our disability community individuals. And first of all, it's, it's a community, but each individual is unique and has different circumstances, and uh, it talks a lot about that and not just bundling people into group homes, which is what used to happen. Right, yeah. That and used treating to everybody the same mm -hmm. and exploiting them and sterilizing them. I yeah. mean, we have a, a very dark history mm -hmm. um, in partly the misunderstanding of what people thought mental illness and caused mental uh, disabilities, but also um, just a different mindset of those who were caring for uh, these individuals and really sort of very awful things that were done to people and now how much we're doing to try to say wait a minute um, these are good souls just like everybody else and need opportunities and need some um, maybe a little bit extra educational support or social supports yeah. to get their feet under them yes. but ultimately many more people can be part of society and productive mm -hmm. and yes. we need to break down the stigmas mm -hmm. we need to um, really incorporate all the wonderful people in our society. Yeah. So um, that Intelligent Lives is a, is a wonderful movie to talk about yeah. some of those things. I'm going to check that out because I haven't seen that okay. yet. Yeah. But I, I got to say, um, when, I, for, when I found my recovery from my addictions, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an alcoholic, I found that first and then I was able to heal, mm. heal myself and heal mm -hmm. my heart. And in uh, the last hospital I went to was a holistic mental health hospital. Taught me a lot. I um, I actually read the book How to Heal Your Life, mm. and that's what it talked about. You're healing your your brain by allowing, accepting yourself, and allowing yourself, and overcoming comfort zones, and you know mm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So, in and, and here I am. I got this purpose in life, you know. Mm. And I like to say to everybody because they say, "Do you make money? Don't you make money?" And I'm like, "No," but I'm telling you, I do because society has paid my way. You know, on social security disability, yeah. I've been paid. And, I you're, got, and you're paying back by doing this that's community right. service. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and in our in our system, we sometimes think everything is about uh, time is money, and uh, are you getting paid exactly for what you do, and is it very linear? And sometimes, um, how society is repaid by all of us paying in to make sure you have the yes. supports you need yeah. is both um, in your health and in trying to make sure you're safe mm -hmm. and have enough to have a housing, uh, we may well save ourselves money by not having to pay for you to be in a hospital or right. if someone like you were to get destitute or desperate, mm -hmm. harm others. Uh, and so this, this system of, of sort of everything has to be measured in dollars and time, mm -hmm. it, it sometimes there's a longer investment. And by investing and in trying to get you healthy into a place where you're ready, now you are a part of our community in this way and you're helping give voice to all the different guests that you've yes. had and have communications with your viewers and there's a value to that yeah, yeah. I, I feel that I, I really feel that and i just i just feel love from from everybody i've never actually experienced where i could be truthful and honest with somebody and it was okay i didn't scare them away mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. and so I want other. I want my peers. That's that's something I want to talk about a little bit. Is too peer support. Yeah. You know because all of these movies that you're doing, there's people that are affected, and if they're getting together, then they're their peers. They they they're experiencing it in different mm -hmm. ways than any of us are. You know. And I'm, I just got to give you cahoots for that. You know that you're doing that. Well, I see. You know, one of the movies you wrote down uh, was called Downstream, and Downstream is a movie about. Our incarceration system yes. and also often incarceration and substance abuse okay. uh, or substance abuse disorders yes. are, are interrelated in a, in a very close way. Um, once someone becomes addicted to some sort of a, a substance, that those that, that don't have the physiology that, that creates that substance abuse disorder don't recognize that um, when you are in withdrawals, of any yeah. one of these drugs, yeah. then you are desperate to get your hands on 
the drug to relieve the negative. People think that it's about enjoying the euphoria. Right. And that's because a lot of folks who casually consume alcohol or cannabis um, feel good for a few hours and go to sleep and go to their business the next day and do what, they, what they're gonna do, but don't really recognize that if one becomes physiologically connected to that substance, that you actually feel like garbage and, and, and using that substance gets you back to not feeling like garbage, it actually doesn't give you a euphoria. And, um, and so then you become desperate not to feel like crap. Yep. And then, then that leads to sometimes having to steal or whatnot to pay yeah. for these challenges. And one of the things about, and, and how that's then related to our criminal justice or injustice yeah. system because um, then you've stolen, then you end up incarcerated, mm -hmm. and it's this downward spiral. And Downstream was a movie made um, right here in Vermont, and it's really about the kids of those families or the nieces and nephews of mm -hmm. someone who's incarcerated. And what is the effect on them and therefore who they become and how they participate in society when we've been using a throw the book at them mentality of put people in jail, put people in jail, put people in prison. And the stigma those kids face in school when their mother or father is uh, incarcerated and how that impacts their ability to learn. Um, it's a really, Downstream is a very powerful movie made here in Vermont. Mm. Um, uh, I'm not remembering the producer and the filmmaker at the moment, but um, it was really powerful. I saw that up in Johnson, which is the area where the film was made and the mm. folks were up there uh, at the inaugural screening. And, um, and then we showed it again, um, and they've shown it all across the state. Uh, and, and these movies just kind of jar us into thinking about things in a different way yes. than where we've sort of been walking lockstep and thinking yes. about things mm -hmm. the way either the media or our society has couched them. And yeah. it says, look at it this different way. Look, instead of at that camera, look at that camera. View it a different way yeah. and, and gets people to think a little bit. Yeah, it yeah. does. It, it really does. I mean, this is this is the way that I kind of like educated myself on on a lot of this stuff is you know healing and holistic approaches and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff is because um, I have seen so many people that suffer like I did, mm. and I'm telling you, I can sit down and have a conversation with them because I lived amongst them and now I'm their peers. Mm -hmm. I'll always be their peers, mm -hmm. always. And they will be mine. They will be somebody that I can talk to. Well, you have a, a lived experience oh, yeah. that you both, you know, and in each of them that you're with both know. And um, I'm, I'm glad that you've sort of broken through and you're sober and that's incredible. Mm -hmm. And then you're using your experience and your ability to reflect on what they're experiencing to try to help them. Um, folks like myself can theoretically try to help, but I can't say I know your experience. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I, mean, I think it takes all of the above to create a system to, to help some people out of that darkness. Yeah. Uh, and some, you know, slip back into it over and over, and yeah. we do our best. Yeah. Uh, there was another movie we showed. Shoot, I can't remember the name of it now, but um, a young man up in Chittenden County lost a number of friends to heroin overdoses. Oh, yeah. And he hiked the long trail to raise money and awareness around opioid uh, abuse oh, disorder. Do you know and that's exactly why I got off that? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the doctor, I mean, I was prescribed it, um, took it for herniated disc and all of that, but nine years, that was a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just like, it's just like psychiatric medication that I take. Hmm. You take it for years and years, and it, this does damage to your body. Right. It does damage to your body, you know? Sure. But in order to keep your mood stable or whatever it is that's bothering you, if you have schizophrenia, then it's the voices or whatever. So they haven't come up with something where they can actually see the, um, the hope of being holistic, mm -hmm. you know, talk therapy, massage therapy, and all that kind of stuff. And I would really like to do a show on that hmm. sometime. Yeah. Well, that would be great. Get some experts on. I'm no expert. Uh, I was lucky enough. I just came back from my 30th high school reunion, which was a lot of fun. And I was talking with some of my classmates about a course that we were lucky enough to have in our public school called Body Mind Research. Yes. And the connection between our bodies and our minds mm -hmm. and our, our health in our mind and our health in our body and each one able to positively or ne negatively impact the other. And mm -hmm. we sort of... We walk around thinking of them as two completely isolated things. You've got your head and your brain and how it thinks, and then you've got your body. But they're 
pretty well connected but in, in all the ways, obviously biologically, but also um, in that, br that broader health arena. And uh, I think we're beginning to understand that a whole lot more yeah. um, as people walk through life and have their jobs and their families and, um, and, and that your mental and your physical health are interrelated. Yeah. And the fact that we treat them differently in medicine, yes. um, that we, we sort of treat physical ailments as an as a illness that is um, you know a terrible shame to have and and we'll do everything to help fix it and then mental health issues are sort of a, a different crisis that don't get the same yeah. cultural support as if you broke your leg exactly. you know yeah. or injured yourself you know in a car accident but it's like well, police oh, are, mental health that's yeah a different, police weird are often thing. called on people with mental health you know mm -hmm. and it, it, it's it's just it's too bad for me I would think call uh, they have an 800 number for a crisis number so if you know somebody's having a hard time you give them that number you stay with them while they call you know mm -hmm. if that's your your friend your family or, or whatever if they want you there right. you know because you can't force anybody with that. Well, and law enforcement is um, law enforcement, but also their public safety officers. Yep, yep. And so is it possible to train our public safety folks in a broader set of de-escalation practices, mm -hmm. whether it's for folks who are going through uh, some sort of either episode or continuum of, of mental health circumstance, whether it's de-escalating a situation between a couple of people on the street. Um, and we've had 30, 40 years of, you know, Law enforcement should get tougher and tougher and just throw you to the ground and tie your hands behind your back and put you in prison. Um, and people go into law enforcement, and I think they have a holistic sense that they're making our communities safer. Um, but I think maybe some of the training and some of the thinking needs to be around, are there different ways to make our community safer than using violent action to do it? Right. And you know, most law enforcement, I think, go into their practice um, believing and, and aiming towards doing well for the community and they don't go in there mm -hmm. thinking they're doing violent action and, and so forth and so they're they're good people oh yeah uh, the vast 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 majority yes. of them um but uh but sometimes they're not given all the tools necessary to help in some of the circumstances that don't fit in the box yeah well you know i know that the here in hartford um, they did have, they do have the psychiatric uh, training for the police officers and that they have a social worker and they invited um, five of my peers from HRS, which is oh, wow. Healthcare and Rehabilitation Services, right. to go and actually um, share with them what it's like to live with it. And it was just so awesome. It was mm -hmm. so awesome. I mean, there was people, there was police officers that we've known for forever because they've always been there to, to support us, always. Right. You know, if we're having whatever kind of issues we're having, they're there right. for that. And we showed a movie called uh, Under the Bridge, which mm -hmm. was about um, a homeless encampment. Uh, maybe it was in Indianapolis, one of the Midwestern cities. And they were ultimately forced to relocate in part because there was going to be a development nearby and the developers wanted a better value for what they had going on and this blight of having this homeless encampment. But this homeless encampment was, you know, Taking people where they were and making sure they had a community, they had food, they had shelter, mm -hmm. they generally had security. There was sort of a, an encampment leader who was sort of the mayor of the town. Uh, and higher-ups, you know, politicians um, forced them to be moved. And law enforcement had to carry out mm -hmm. their orders from their bosses. So it's not necessarily their direct fault. Um, yeah. They're just trying to pit pay the bills and put food on their table too and they were told clear these people out and it was really disruptive and there were religious leaders and other groups who were involved with helping these folks with blankets and food and um, non-chemical uh, ways to find joy uh, and in the end it was you know completely disrupted and um, so yet another movie so people can again look many of these up yeah. um, but, uh, you know, so that's one piece of the outreach we do. I go to Rotary Clubs. I go to a lot of school groups. Uh, I got elected in 2016, and I think I can safely say here in Vermont where our current president is least liked in this state of any state in the country, uh, mm -hmm. I got elected that same night. And so it was definitely a, a mixed emotion of winning statewide office and watching my daughter's future uh, related to climate change and the Supreme Court 
uh, really go down the toilet. It was a pretty depressing night. Um, but I really thought that, okay, part of my job, uh, because the Lieutenant Governor's job is defined as a few things, but then it's really make it what you will in a lot of ways. And these movies and going to schools and rotary clubs is to really just try to be an ambassador for democracy and really just talk more about how people's voices can be used in a positive and effective way. Right. Um, I try to point out that most people out there uh, know more about what they know than most of us elected people know about what they know. Mm -hmm. it, we know a little bit about a wide range of things because this issue comes up, we learn something about it, we vote on it based on the expertise of some of our colleagues, but we don't know deeply about every single topic that comes in front of us. Right. And so each person out there in their lived experience has an experience knowledge base, uh, small business owner, sports player, therapist, yeah. contractor, yeah. farmer, yeah. whatever it is that you do um, or is your passion, uh, you probably know more about it than most of the legislature. So if you don't call and talk to your legislator about it, especially if you hear that topic is being discussed, they're going to find out information from someone else. Yeah. And usually it's a, a lobbyist in the building, which is, they are reasonable people, but they are paid to be there with a certain perspective on whatever that issue is. And you as a constituent have every right to also call your legislator and say, what are you doing about this? Or what do you know about this? And let the legislator talk to you for a bit. And then you can offer, well, here, this is my field. And yeah, can exactly. I offer you some more information? And as one of your constituents, here's my thoughts. And they're not always going to agree with you, but in the end, if you've talked to them about the issue in an experienced way, that's going to impact how they think about that issue. Yeah. And so we, true. as elected people in this very small state with very little staff to no staff, I have one. As a legislator, <laughs> I had zero. Um, it's either the lobbyists or your constituents that are your primary source of information and the witnesses that testify in committee. So if you're not speaking up, then they're getting the info from somewhere else. So I'm, I'm very much trying to encourage people about how democracy works and how your input can work when in our schooling we're not really taught that. We're just taught there's executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch, and they work things out, and that's how things become law. Yeah, no. And the judicial branch interprets it. Well, they become law by you using your voice and speaking up. Um, and hopefully in a, in a respectful way. You know, there's plenty of people that disagree with me who... Some give me a, a, a pretty aggressive hard time, but most will call and say, hey, you know, I really disagree with you on that. And I'll call them back and I'll say, okay, tell me your thoughts. And we might end up still saying, you know, we're not, we're not on the same page, but I've learned something from you, you've learned something from me, and we'll at least try to come up with a, a, a solution that works in the future for all of us. Um, and other times people are like, hey, you're spot on. I'm like, but you know more, give me more info. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and really having respectful conversation, which is, hard in the, in the social media world that we're mm -hmm. in right now yes. is something that I've been really trying to uh, help promulgate in my conversations. Well, you know, the best honor that I've ever gotten was the state resolution from uh, the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was like two or three years after I started the show, and it was the most wonderful thing mm. that I was given by the uh, senators and everybody else, and mm -hmm. it was just priceless to me. You know? Well, it's acknowledging what you're doing, as we said earlier, with mm -hmm. the, the uh Well, they started calling me the Oprah of Vermont. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's my title. Well, we'll get the audience a little bigger next time. <laughs> yeah. It'll grow. you got to start giving things away. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Uh, yeah, and you know, I wanted to let you know, too, that I could not do any of this without CATV, Peg TV, and I don't ever want to lose it. Yeah. No, public access is really important. I know every couple of years the contracts come up and... Comcast and some of the other um, cable owners um, keep trying to squeeze on how much they have to pay in to have public oh, access. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've been on probably dozens, if not hundreds, of public access shows over the years, whether it's down here, down in Manchester, Bennington, uh, Brattleboro, Burlington, uh, up in Franklin County and St. Albans. Nice. Um, you know, these, these community shows are watched by more people than folks think. Oh, yeah. You know, maybe it's not, you know, the millions that watch, you know, the, the evening news or the late night comedy shows, but, um, but they really help connect people to what's going on. Then they see you on the street. Oh, I saw this show. Yeah. And, or I saw you on that show. And 
Thanks for talking about that topic. And it just leads to, again, that, that community and civility that is really important. I really appreciate you coming and talking about what you're, what you're doing here. And I want to be able to invite you back. As a matter of fact, um, I didn't know if you'd ever gone to, like, the, uh, the Turning Point Recovery Center. I've been to a number of them. In fact, I was in one in Rutland just a few weeks back, and I've been to the one in Burlington. Uh, and they're, uh, they're fantastic centers. Uh, each has run its own way, and, and some have been getting more access to resources than others. But opportunities for folks who are struggling with substance abuse disorders and addiction to uh, have peer groups for support, have counseling on helping with housing and or job hunts. You know. um, the turning points do a lot of really good work. Well, and I know there's groups, uh, the Tatros are doing a lot of work up in Johnson. They yep. lost their daughter yeah, to yeah. an overdose. And, you know, they just feel like there's got to be some kind of community center for people, for people to do things that don't always include substances, uh, yeah. for places that are safe for people mm -hmm. who, who are struggling with the day-to-day -day pull of substance abuse and the ability to be with others who can hold their hands and help them through the rough spots and play some pool or yeah. ping pong or do something to, yeah. to get some joy out of a day without needing to, um, to, to feed the beast of the addiction. And, uh, and so there's folks touched across Vermont by uh, these, these challenges for sure. And mm -hmm. folks are doing stuff, turning points, the Tatros and many others trying to, to raise awareness and, and help people. Yeah. I just really appreciate you coming and being here and sharing with what you're doing. I mean, because I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just appreciate it when, when you listen. It was like the, the governor that came and everybody that came, they can't make you any promises, but they can listen. Well, and, you know, there is the okay. promise that we can keep working to right, get right. more funding for support services, that yep. we can fight for raising the minimum wage so that people aren't, you know, I, I happen to think we are seeing an increase in mental health challenges because people are suffering and struggling in that day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month financial struggle that is our yeah. economy right now, yeah. whether it's affordable housing, whether it's raising wages so that people actually get paid a dignified wage for their work and a living wage for their work. Uh, there are things we can do if we break the chain of this trickle-down economics mentality that started since Reaganomics within our capitalist structure. Mm. It's totally understandable. People think, hey, if I had more money, I'd spend it locally. That's true when you're making 30000 60000 yeah, okay. $100,000, even $200,000. Yeah. You might put a deck on your porch. Mm. But these people that, are, that have tens of millions of dollars and even billions of dollars, as, as candidate and our senator, uh, Bernie Sanders, are talking about, there's no more trickle down. When you have a billion dollars, you're not you're not adding more decks onto your onto your house. You've already got 16 decks. You don't need a 17th deck. You're not creating local economy. And so I promise that I will work towards uh, an economy that says, yes, having some more money is a good thing. But there comes a point where our system is concentrating the money in the hands of a few. And if we work towards having more people being economically stable by a better minimum wage, by having more affordable housing, by having better opportunities for people to get to work other than their own car. Yep. We can do things to both help resolve the climate crisis and reduce that stress on people that's leading to some folks to have mental health challenges. Exactly. And that is something that, that until we connect those dots mm -hmm. and people think, oh, I should just have more money because I work harder, it's gonna cost you more in the long run by incarceration, by yeah. ill health for people. And um, so I'll promise you it's not just nothing. I'm gonna keep working for those kinds of things. You know what, I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank and you that, so much for, thank coming, you, Linda. for coming on Walking Through Life. And I hope you uh, find your way back here. You bet, have to. Okay. So this is Linda Carver now, and we're saying goodbye for Walking Through Life today. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Like how to love and how